Greetings. Welcome to our virtual summit, Time to Rise 2020. I'm Naila Chaudhry, Director of Social Impact and Innovation, UC San Diego. Today's panel is in partnership with FSUN, Foundation for the Support of the United Nations. I'm honored to host the panel, Thriving with Resilience in Times of Crisis. The topic is very, very critical right now. The social challenges we are facing are complex, requires innovation, technology, creativity, and dedication. We have brought together today diverse group of transformation leaders, change makers, innovators, responsible citizens, policy makers, media, and civil society leaders working in unison to build bridges and share information and experience to help achieve our goals. Every crisis leads to opportunities. The economic fallout from the pandemic is the deepest global recession since World War II. Resilience to thrive in times of crisis requires group effort. The world, humanity, and climate are in desperate needs of leaders who will lead leave behind a legacy interlinked with the 17 development goal of UN for a sustainable world, leaving no one behind, where equity, diversity, and inclusion is the center of all we do, where dignity and freedom is the basic right of life and humanity. Today's speakers and moderators are leaders who define resilience as channeling one's energy, productivity to emerge, from adversity stronger than ever. Our moderator, Janet Salazar, who's the president and executive chairman of United Nations Permanent Representative and Permanent Observer to the UN Economic and Social Council at the Foundation for the Support of the United Nations. Janet has built an ecosystem of change agents and influencers in the global diplomatic community. She is a strong voice of partnership inside the United Nations. She is widely known for bringing the business and private sector's perspective inside the United Nations by convening global forums in partnership with UN entities, permanent reps, missions, NGO, and Fortune 500 companies. Janet, above everything, is a compassionate leader, a passionate advocate, defender of the right to freedom in all forms. I have experienced and seen her firsthand, especially glad to be part of establishing UCSD partnership with UN through her. It is true, like I always say, Janet long ago has sprouted wings and took flight, but she always returns to help everyone below become butterflies like her. Today's moderator, Janet Salazar, and all our esteemed speakers, are profound with their profound sense of responsibility to bring about a positive impact by channeling influence and power to purpose. With this, Janet Salazar, I give the platform to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naila, and I'm so happy and thrilled to be here. And thank you for that sweet, kind, thoughtful introduction. Um, I don't know what to say. That was so awesome. Anyway, um, I wanted this conversation to be truly impactful, but at the same time, a very relaxed, you know, um, conversational one where we could just really share with our audience what we truly feel and how we truly um, see, you know, this, uh, these times that we are into right now, especially this, I want to say, we're experiencing a multi, multi-layer of, of um, a macro crisis that we have right now globally. So um, I'm excited to to hear from all our panelists. And Naila, thank you so much for bringing us all together. I believe this is such a um, a critical um, time right now to be talking about you know the topics that we have ahead. I'm so excited um, with you know, to have the diversity of voices that are joining us right now with four amazing women. And uh, Naila, I'm, I'm, I'm equally grateful to have you on this journey together. I mean, we've known each other um, at the UN almost a decade ago and so grateful for all your support. You've always been there 
throughout all our six power of collaboration global summit to you and um, you so deserve to uh, completely also be supported in everything that you do for everyone and so um, this conversation and this moment is one of those where you know we just truly wanted to um, to um, collaborate together and, and and bring forward what is necessary for other people to to learn, um, contribute, have insights, shares, etc. So, um, Naila, again, thank you for putting this panel together. So, without much ado, I'd like to briefly introduce our esteemed panelists who are joining us today. I'm so excited! Um, first up is Roberta Baskin, our veteran investigative journalist. Roberta, welcome. Um, thank you. Roberta Baskin has been honored with more than 75 journalism awards. People get that, 75 journalism awards. That is phenomenal, Roberta. She's also a uh, prestigious, she's part of the prestigious and awarded a prestigious Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University. The results of her investigations have improved government and corporate practices affecting environmental regulations, healthcare, and consumer protection, which is very important. Most recently, Roberta shifted her focus to showcase outstanding companies, thousands of businesses helping to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, close to my heart. Thank you so much, Roberta, and welcome. Next up is, thank you, and uh, our next speaker is Dr. Hannah Brixey. Um, she is part of the senior management at the World Bank. Dr. Hannah Brixey, welcome. Um, she leads a global effort to accelerate more investments in people for greater equity and economic growth. In her career, Dr. Brixey has been advancing progress on human development, governance, and macroeconomic and fiscal policy. That's heavy. She served as practice manager leading World Bank's engagement on social protection and jobs in the Middle East and North Africa, otherwise known as the MENA region. She was global lead for service delivery. She was also lead economies for MENA, East Asia and the Pacific, Europe and Central Asia regions. She was based in China from 2001 to 2010, where she also served as World Health Organization sector manager and UNICEF's social policy chief. Dr. Bixi published several books, including Trust, Voice, and Incentives, and Government Risk, and numerous articles and topics of public finance, governance, and human development in professional journals. That is some accomplishment. Dr. Hannah Bixi, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Dr. Lisa Ordonez is our next speaker. She is the Dean for the Rady School of Business, University of California, San Diego, UCSD. Dr. Lisa Ordonez's leadership is deeply informed by her research in the field of ethical behavior in organizations. As a first generation college graduate, she also understands the impact that access to quality education can bring to underserved populations and is committed to fostering a community of inclusion. Dr. Lisa Ordonez, welcome, and thank you for joining us. And not, but not, last but not least, Dr. Becky Pettit, Vice Chancellor of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UC San Diego. Dr. Becky Pettit joined UC San Diego in March 2015 and brings over 25 years of progressive administrative experience in equity, diversity, and inclusion work across the higher education communities. That's a very specialized field. Prior to UC San Diego, she served as the Associate Vice President and Chief of Staff for the Office of Diversity at Texas A&M University where she provided vision and leadership for Texas A&M University's diversity plan, which is acknowledged as a national exemplar of sustainable institutional change. I love that. She's a nationally recognized consultant specializing in equity and diversity in higher education, organizational learning, and organizational change. Dr. Becky Petito, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. 
Um, all right, so woo. <laughs> I'm gonna take a little bit of a breather from that whole highly accomplished um, ladies that are joining us today, and I'm um, truly excited and honored again to to be in your company. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and dive right into our question and answer um, portion. And um, Nyla, please feel free after each and every question, if you have insights or additional input, um, just dive in as well. So our first question is for Dr. Hannah Brixey. Uh, Hannah is the world, well, um, head of the World Bank's Human Capital Project. Could you explain what that is? and how it supports resilience during crisis, such as what we're having right now. Thank you so much, Janet. I'm thrilled to be uh, in this panel today. So first, let me tell you what human capital is. So human capital consists of the knowledge, health, and skills that uh, people accumulate throughout their lives and that enable them to realize their potential as productive members of society. And more human capital is associated with higher earnings for people, with higher income for countries, and with stronger cohesion in societies. So analysis show that human capital has been a central driver of sustainable growth and poverty reduction. However, as measured by the Human Capital Index, a child born today may achieve only about 56% of her productive potential. And in many developing countries, this fraction is even much lower. So the Human Capital Project is a global effort to protect and invest in people. It involves country governments and partners to promote more and better investments in people. So the Human Capital Project seeks to engage the whole of society in countries and it promotes res resilient, inclusive and good quality health and education services. It promotes better social protection systems that help people overcome extreme poverty and overcome shocks such as the shock that we, we see today due to the pandemic. And the project also promotes other services that are key for healthy development of children and people. So that includes, of course, clean water, nutritious food, uh, safe environment, housing, infrastructure, community services, and so on. So you see, it's really, it takes a whole of the society as well as whole of the, of the government. Now, right before the pandemic, more people than ever were accessing essential services. So the Human Capital Index has actually improved in 90% of countries that we analyzed in the decade right up to the pandemic. However, now the pandemic threatens to wipe out many of these hard-won gains. So the consequences are especially harsh for women and girls. So for the World Bank Group, and through the Human Capital Project, we are working closely with countries to mitigate the immediate impacts uh, of the pandemic. And uh, to give you a few examples, so we focus on improving financial and digital inclusion, such as digital cash payments to poor households, using both old and new technologies to improve service delivery, uh, such as providing multimodal education through the internet, TV, and radio to reach all students, and to prioritize investments in the next generation, so including programs for child development at the community level, learning, nutrition, and so on. So let me conclude by highlighting that the human capital, so people are really the foundation for resilience, for resilience of societies and of economies during this crisis and also for future crisis. And importantly, it is really the foundation and hope for the future. Back to you, Janet. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hannah. Um, that a few of your words actually just also reminded me of an affirmation from uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, in terms of us really, you know, um, 
experiencing this and how uh, it's women and girls that are truly marginalized and heavily burdened on this um, economic, social, uh, everything that we're going on and experiencing. So to that, um, you mentioned that, you know, really girls and women are, are heavily burdened, um, you know, right now with, with everything that's going on. So I, I wanted to ask, um, could you please elaborate more on that? And what do you think are, what do you think are the pathways to, for us to mitigate this or at least, you know, find solutions so that this doesn't prevail? I mean, there, there's gotta be something that we could do. And I know the World Bank is really doing a lot of amazing things and projects already to this and with your projects. But yeah, I would love to hear more about, yeah, what, what you think would be done on this front. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. This is, this is an excellent question. Of course, we all have experienced and are experiencing firsthand how the pandemic impacts lives, right? Our ability to leave home, to work, for our children to go to schools, access services, and so on. And worldwide, it is women and girls that bear the heaviest burden. And I'll give you four examples. So first, women globally play the key role in combating the pandemic. They account for 70% of health and workers globally. They bear the heaviest burden in taking care for the sick and vulnerable in their households and communities. Second, women have been impacted most by the disruptions in essential services due to the pandemic. So for example, maternal mortality has been rising and is expected to rise up to 40% in some countries, according to the analysis in Lancet Journal. 47 million women have lost access to contraception, and this now leads to 7 million unintended pregnancies, according to UNFPA. Now third, lockdowns themselves have seen sharp impact on women, especially in gender-based violence. So many countries are reporting a substantial increase in emergency calls for domestic violence cases. And it is estimated that 31 million of additional cases of gender-based violence will be caused by the pandemic. And finally, school closures. They are especially detrimental for girls. Girls are less likely to return to classroom when schools reopen. And this is what we have seen, for example, in the aft aftermath of the Ebola uh, outbreak. And girls are now already becoming more likely to end up in child marriages and adolescent pregnancy. So what needs to be done and what the World Bank Group and other partners are supporting are essential services for women and girls including reproductive health, maternal health care, shelters, legal aid for women, and protection services for women and uh, girls. So we are also working to bridge the gender uh, digital divide that exists and that can help, uh, uh, you know, as digital services can help girls continue their education and also can help women to find jobs after uh, the pandemic or even during the pandemic. So broadening access to online education and employment resources and boosting digital skills for women and girls is really one of the priorities. To give you some, some examples of our engagement, so in India, for example, new cash transfers are now reaching 200 million women and women's self-help groups are being supported to work to meet shortages in masks and sanitizers, run community kitchens, uh, provide support to vulnerable families, and disseminate uh, advisories regarding the pandemic and re regarding domestic violence and so on. Uh, in Cameroon, women peace builders, for example, have included domestic violence in their advocacy campaign which include videos, referrals, uh, one-stop service centers, uh, radio programs, and so on. And uh, the effort is really to influence social norms, which often are at the core of the challenges that women are facing. So to conclude, 
women have a critical role in combating the pandemic, uh, in protecting lives and in building sustainable recovery for the future. And governments and communities and, and partners, all of us must ensure that there is access to essential services, services that women and girls depend on for their survival and for their well-being. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was indeed very enlightening. And um, hopefully we, we can hear more, you know, if, if there's any um, other um, avenues that we could, um, uh, you know, listen, listen more and learn more about everything that you just shared with us. That would be amazing. Um, thank you again so much. Um, now, um, our next question is for uh, Roberta Baskin. Um, in your extraordinary journey, as an investigative reporter um, in investigative journalism, so to speak. Um, how challenging is it right now with our present situation to tell stories of hope and resilience out there? I mean, I, it's pretty much like against, against the tide with especially the past months, but I'm sure you are finding ways to to be true to your um, calling and your mission, which is, you know, through through your investigative journalism to spread that hope and resilience. So could you tell us more about that journey, Roberta? Well, I want to um, double click a little bit on what Hannah was talking about in terms of the impact of the pandemic on, on women and just mention that women's leadership in, in the countries that are handling the pandemic best seem to be seem to have women leaders, so I couldn't let that pass. Um, in terms of storytelling, I have always, as an investigative reporter, bounded out of bed in the morning to tell people stories about companies and, and wrongdoing. Companies doing a bad thing was fascinating to me, and I wanted to tell you about it and hopefully provide solutions. But after doing that for decades, um, I've come around to feeling that people are hungry in their soul for stories about solutions. They want to know not what companies are, are, are doing a bad thing so much, but who's doing it right? Who can we turn to? Who can we support with our, with our money uh, in terms of companies that are ethical and, um, and, and doing the right thing in the world? I think about the sustainable development goals, which are very close to my heart, and, and really what the whole world agreed to five years ago 2015 in September, um, where 193 countries all voted unanimously in the UN General Assembly to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. And um, to Hannah, Hannah's point, gender equality is number five, um, ending poverty and hunger and climate action and, and peace and justice and decent work. This is the world's to-do list for what needs to happen by 2030. And so um, against that former backdrop of saying what doesn't work, I am looking for stories of, um, of resilience and hope. And um, there's a whole B Corp movement out there of companies that are certified in terms of ensuring that they take care not just of their stockholders, but also of the environment and of their employees. And you can't be a certified B Corp and be treating the environment in a, in a positive way that you get a lot of points for, but not treating your, your workers well. You have to, you have to meet the, the challenges of many things to become a B Corp. And so, uh, you know, I think about the, the most important thing in the sustainable development goals, really num the one, number one is ending poverty, ending hunger. Um, those are the first two SDGs, global goals. And I think about you know, the hunger that we have in our souls for stories um, about resilience and hope. And, and somebody like um, Chef Andre, who is parachuting into places in the world that are suffering from hurricanes and, and um, from various disasters um, and feeding people. And, and the importance of not just feeding them with food, but also feeding their souls in terms of caring for them, the nurturing and, and um, you know, taking, care of, taking care of each other. Um, so there are so many stories. If you look at the news as the history of the day, 
it's not always a very accurate picture. There are really um, amazing things that are happening in the world. There are heroes and there are families taking care of other families and there are politicians who are doing the right thing. And so um, through a program that I, that I uh, founded called Aim to Flourish, we work with, um, in more than 100 business, well, 100 countries with business schools around the world to ask this army of business school students to go out and do the research and find a hero in a business, find a company that is doing something amazing in some way to achieve one of the, glo one of the global goals, one of the 17 or more than one of the 17 global goals and, and do the interview in an appreciative way what inspired that business leader, that CEO, that innovator um, to move into this particular way of doing business. And so we now have more than 2,700 stories written by business school students in more than 100 countries about um, you know, corporate achievement in terms of helping to achieve the SDGs. We're not there yet. We have 10 years to go to achieve them and we're, you know, we're behind. But um, there are really good people out there and good businesses and stories to be told about what works. And, and that's become a joy. Thank you, Roberta. It's just so heartwarming to know that you have embraced um, advancing, helping advance the sustainable development goals are your uh, life mission. That, that's so fantastic. Um, um, so we talk about all this and at the, at the heart of it all, I believe is um, the, one of the driving force, which is to have hopefully a, a more just and equitable society. So what do you envision um, personally to be a just an equitable society? Well, I think basic civility and empathy, teaching that in schools, um, teaching that to each other in, you know, what, whatever um, religion or, you know, spirituality um, you care about. It's treating others as you want to be treated. And I think the thing that haunts me most that I, that I lie awake in bed and think about is the disparity also between the super wealthy and, and, and the poor poverty. It's most disturbing to me. I mean, there's more than 2,000 billionaires in the world, and that number has doubled in the last decade. And so I think about that growing chasm with so few controlling so much money while children are dying of, of preventable diseases and are starving, um, it, that's un unacceptable. And so I think in some sense, what has created that is a lot of comp competition, competition to you know, have the most money, to be the richest guy in the world, the richest guy in the room. And um, I think that's a very old paradigm. And I think we're on the cusp of something new and beautiful in terms of collaboration. And um, collaboration and cooperation has to be the road in terms of um, achieving a more just and equitable world. Um, that combined with, as I said, civility and, and just basic empathy, caring, caring for others. And I feel we're you know, in a really live or die moment for our civilization. Um, that things are, um, there's a lot of competing crises right now in terms of the climate crisis, which I'm somewhat obsessed with in terms of, you know, what can we do about that? Yeah, I put solar panels on my house and drive an electric car and, you know, eating less meat. But it's, it's a much bigger thing than indi individuals can all do what they can do, but it needs to be basic, you know, uh, public policy change in terms of supporting um, a green economy and um, not a um, extractive economy. And, and we need to make sacrifices. And we need to be prepared to make sacrifices in terms of thinking about um, our, our human family, humanity, um, not just what's in it for me, or what can I get, or how can I keep up with that person, and instead to, um, to, to really focus on how we can collaborate and work together to create the world that we all want. 
I really think it's achievable, and this is the magical moment in terms of where we're either going to, you know, sink into despair and just let the climate crisis go and have, you know, weather that and and uh, climate that is out of control and burn and fires and floods and all that goes with that, or we're going to get our act together in a beautiful way and and create a civilization beyond anything that we've dreamed of in the past. I'm hopeful. Hope. I hang on to hope. <laughs> From the time I know Roberta, she's too humble. She's the one actually, after the 100 countries, allowed us to bring in online SDG courses into UCSD. And with Dean Lisa, I would like you to sort of collaborate after this because she has had a curriculum for years which could be replicated and scaled up. And we've just signed a contract. And thank you, Roberta. You're too humble from the time I know you. You've only enlightened me and filled up the answers to many questions, which keeps me awake at night. Thank you for what you do. Nyla, that, that is so sweet. It is all about collaboration. It's not successful. The Aim to Flourish program is successful because of the professors all around the world who care about it and nurture it and share it with each other about what works, what doesn't work, how to make it better. It's a huge collaboration um, and very grassroots. So I, I have to put it on the, on the professors, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, ladies. And uh, um, the next question would be for uh, Dr. Becky Pettit, um, which is, again, like I said earlier, what, what um, all Roberta shared is a great segue. Um, Dr. Pettit, you are a transformational uh, leader in your in your in your own realm, and uh, I've read so much about you, and just so inspired about the work that you do um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and specifically um, the critical work that you do in the space of the Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-racism. I, for one, is a you know, I, I want to say I'm, I'm doing everything I can to also um, influence that space and, you know, to really be out there and visible because this needs some, this, this needs as much collaboration and cooperation and partnerships as possible. So, um, Becky, could you tell us more about your work on this space and what do we need to learn more to be, to be more supportive? Thank you for that question. Um, so I have been inspired to do this work, um, having grown up with a mother who was an activist. So watching her advocate for my brother who is deaf, watching her advocate for those who were not at the table and um, demanding that we make space for others at the table who are excluded. Uh, so in this moment, I have to be really honest and say that I, I feel so privileged to be doing this work at this time, at this time of both tragedy and opportunity for incredible uh, transformation. And if I were not in the space of working toward a solution, I literally don't know um, if I would be able to breathe. And I don't say that to be overly dramatic, but this is, it's personally hard for me as a black woman. That makes it that much more important for me as a black woman to create a better world um, for the people who come after me to inhabit. And it's really, difficult to believe, um, to, to come to awareness that we are repeating history. I taught a class years ago about the leadership of the Black Civil Rights Movement and uh, took my students to meet people like uh, Coretta Scott King, like Rosa Parks, like um, folks who were involved in the movement at that time. And it's really striking to see that we are repeating some of the lessons that we thought we'd learned. Um, so what the way I'm framing the work we are doing right now in the context of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, um, it's more than a moment, it's, it's a movement, is that we need to work to be anti-racist. Looking at the work of Ibram uh, Kendi, 
whose, whose work is also grounded in a lot of other scholars and, and activists who came before him. But what does it mean to be actively anti-racist? And I use this um, quote from um, Beverly Daniel Tatum, who in her book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? She used a metaphor to help us understand how systems of power that were built long ago continue to move forward and how each of us is complicit unless we intentionally act. What she wrote was, I sometimes visualize the ongoing cycle of racism as a moving walkway at the airport. Active racist behavior is equivalent to walking fast on the conveyor belt. Passive racist behavior is equivalent to standing still on the walkway. No overt effort is being made but the conveyor belt moves bystanders along to the same destination as those who are actively walking. But unless they are walking actively in the opposite direction at a speed faster than the conveyor belt, unless they are being actively anti-racist, they'll find themselves carried along with the others. So right now I'm working with our campus leadership to facilitate a 21 day um, uh, anti-racism challenge, teaching people how to be actively anti-racist. So we're going through 21 days of curriculum, learning about how we got here, learning about what it means to examine our own worldviews, our own ways of being, our own beliefs, and um, to think about finding our, our place in this movement. What can we do to create a world where we are all um, liberated? understanding how we are connected, right? I don't want people feeling like black people want something special. We want equity, right? We, we want people to, um, to be actively anti-racist. So one of the um, other, and I'll stop talking here in a second. One of the key things that helps us move this forward also is a comprehensive strategic plan. So I can talk more about that later if we have time, but it is a plan that holds all unit leaders on our campus accountable for moving us forward, right? So, so my, my area of expertise is in higher education, equity, diversity, and inclusion in higher ed. And I think we have a special trust and a special responsibility to educate. So thank you for the question. Thank you so much, um, Becky. That was that was necessary for a lot of us, I believe, and just to share your passion and your life mission. Um, on a lighter note, um, in a more personal level, how are you adjusting to all these, um, well, we call um, a continuously evolving normal of our lives, both on a professional level and a personal level? I mean, instead of meeting people like what we're having right now in person, we're doing this virtually, et cetera. How are you adjusting to also um, making sure that your impact to as many people as you want to influence in terms of your advocacy is um, maximized? Yeah. So did you did you preface this by saying on a lighter note? <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it, it, it really is challenging, right? With, in equity, diversity, and inclusion, when we talk about the pandemic that has us in this remote environment, as Roberta was saying, uh, it's, and then maybe Hannah also, this has really impacted minoritized communities in a disproportionate way, right? Um, so thinking about how essential workers are both called essential, but also treated as somewhat disposable, like they are among the first to have to return to work uh, to keep the environments disinfected and clean for the rest of us. And so it's um, the, the pandemic combined with this uh, overly racist environment that we're living in right now has been um, challenging. So again, in the spirit of being transparent and, and really honest, doing the work that I do, knowing that minoritized uh, uh, communities, women, people of color um, are disproportionately impacted. I am having to help us rethink our policies, helping us rethink and reimagine um, how we can uh, 
help people thrive in this environment? How do we help our young scholars who are having to study at home in um, less than optimal environments where some people are challenged with having access to internet, where some people are having challenges having a quiet space to study because they live in a multi-generational household, where our um, women who are often um, uh, tasked with more caregiving responsibilities, what does it mean to continue to pursue your scholarship, right? when you have caregiving responsibilities. So it is um, both making that visible um, and working with our campus leaders to demonstrate compassion, to be flexible, to be nimble, to be um, generous, uh, and to be thoughtful about how we support uh, ourselves and each other um, through this time. Right. So what policies can be flexible? What things, how might we shift some of the responsibilities? How might we reframe what excellence looks like in this environment? So it's reimagining what's possible. And I don't, I don't, I think we are adjusting to a new normal. Right. So this is what, what normal looks like. I don't think we'll do meetings quite in the same way after this point. I don't think we will do teaching in quite the same way after this period of time, but um, really helping us learn what it means to be fully human, to be fully connected and to give grace. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I love the words um, reimagining possibilities. That, that, that truly needs to be embraced um, right now. Thank you so much again. And uh, our, our next question is for uh, Dr. Lisa Ordonez. Um, you yourself has, um, has been a, an inspiration to a lot of people around you and your life has been, uh, uh, has significantly impacted others for the better. Um, could you please share us a little bit more on this um, you know, so so we may we may uh, learn from you and and, and be enlightened, um, and and have more hope and uh, resilience in in these times uh, that we're having right now. Well, thank you. Well, um, you know, I, I I feel grateful for the time in which I was I was born. Uh, I grew up in Central California on a ranch in a rural area, um, but I feel like. I was the transition generation for women. There were many women before me who had much tougher uh, situations. Uh, and I was born at a time there were still want ads for women uh, and men. Uh, and that is obviously no longer possible in this country. Um, and we were still dealing with many of the, the issues, but the opportunities were there and they certainly were there for me. So for me, I actually uh, call myself a double first generation because both my parents uh, did not complete high school. My mother didn't even attend high school. And for me to be able to, you know, achieve the, the levels that I have is testament to the opportunities that we have, or maybe had. <laughs> I don't want to be discouraging, but I, th I think, you know, back when I was a student at UC Berkeley, my fees were $250 a semester. Now, so 500 a year, you know, now it's 13,000. And that's just tuition, that's not books, that's not living. So I worry for our, for our youth that you know, we have the opportunity for, for all. And many will uh, complain and say, well, why is the cost of education gone up so much? And I say, no, actually, the price of education has gone up. Uh, the cost itself is actually an infl inflation adjusted dollar has gone down because we've had to do things to accommodate fewer uh, state resources. So every, every state in the U.S. has decreased drastically in the last even just 10, 15 years, the state support given to state institutions like UC San Diego. Uh, and unfortunately, those funds, and that's a big question of where those funds go, they have gone almost dollar for dollar to prison systems. Um, and so what we find is there is fewer opportunities for students, they're still there, uh, I still believe in this country, um, but I am grateful that I was able to uh, go through undergrad, uh, master's and graduate all uh, at UC Berkeley um, without student loans. 
um, because my family weren't they weren't able to help me physically. They were able there to help me emotionally, of course. Uh, so I, you know, I feel very grateful for the opportunities that I've received, and I see that we are, you know, really working hard at UC San Diego and all of the UC to uh, make sure that those opportunities are available uh, to all. In fact. One of the questions you guys had asked was, uh, what is one of my favorite uh, SDGs? And it is uh, reducing inequalities. Because as, uh, as unfortunately the recently passed uh, leader, Layla uh, uh, Jaden said, you know, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. Um, and I think the type of uh, activities that we're doing in the UC and thank you to Dr. Pettit for the work she's doing that we can make sure there are more opportunities for students so that we can see the progress and we can attain more of what what Hannah was talking about and and the human capital capital and getting access to as much of that as possible. Thank you so much and uh, as a follow-up to that how do you see your continuing effort and your leadership um, uh, bettering, you know, more of our younger generation. Um, like what you pointed out earlier, there's a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges, and so um, the same with you know, the rest of our speakers has been, you know, pointed out. How, how do you, how do you see yourself on a personal capacity and professional capacity as well, um, making sure that you know it, it's going to be better for for our younger generation? Right. So. You know, as a business professor and a management professor, you know, business gets a bad rap a lot um, because we have for many years focused on stake stakeholder share value um, and on maybe a more uh, carrot and stick approach to management. And I do see a, a big change occurring in research and instruction and management. We are focusing on finding ways to make organizations um, uh, higher, you know, higher intrinsic motivation so that people love the work that they do um, and uh, more ethical. And it's actually what I study is how to help organizations be more ethical. So that's an important topic for me. But I also think we're focusing very uh, strongly on EDI issues. So it's no longer just the right thing to do to have a equitable, diverse, uh, an inclusive environment, it is the smart thing to do. Uh, there are now hundreds, if not thousands, of, of academic studies and uh, uh, other studies showing that organizations that are more diverse um, are, more, uh, are more productive, they're, they have higher profits, um, and they're more innovative. And I can give you many examples but the important thing to know is, and especially at times when, you know, as a pandemic and resources are lower, that if it is the smart thing to do, we won't just throw out EDI uh, initiatives when things uh, get tough because, you know, we don't have the money for it. No, this is how we make sure that our organization continues on and survives through tough times. And it's the first thing that we should double down on to make sure that we have the best uh, workers who are in the best environment. So um, I think um, I think of business as a way and business research as a way to to study how can we make lives better? Um, how can we make organizations better so that they fulfill? And in fact, uh, the Business Roundtable has uh, focused on uh, expanding our ideas of what uh, uh, corporations should be focused on beyond shareholder value and working to uh, increase an economy that serves all Americans by by adding other metrics like uh, the equity uh, of the organization and promotion and uh, ethic, ethical behavior of the organizations itself. And believe me, it's much more than just uh, a set of, of uh, activities that we do for CSR or for some uh, set of, of uh, ethical priorities for organization. It means actually doing something about those priorities. Thank you, thank you, um, Lisa. And I think um, the, the um, before we conclude, Nyla has uh, questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I, 
I'm sure Nyla will uh, share with us, you know, just very briefly very what briefly. the questions are all about that she has prepared for our um, speakers. But I uh, just wanted to, again, thank so much um, each and every one of you. Ladies, I wish we had more time. I wanted to pick more of your base in terms of um, uh, what you've shared uh, from, from Hannah to Roberta to Becky and then Lisa. Um, but um, I'm sure we'll have more opportunities later on to, to share more of, of uh, what we've discussed today. Um, in the meantime, uh, I would love to pass uh, 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 this time on to um, Nyla. I, I believe you have questions. Um, Around the sustainable I think all of them have addressed the question, but I would like to thank all of you and let you all know, let this platform be the beginning of your collaboration because each of you are leaders, people look up to like North Stars and let it be a beginning where we collaborate. I know Janet has a lot of podcasts coming up from you and hopefully she'll invite all of you to speak on issues which the world would hear and let's work together towards a stronger platform for leaders like you all and I would love to be a support to you all and I can't like sort of stop the program but I have to acknowledge Becky from the time she came I felt she's turned the whole campus into something. I would say it's a social behavioral change and the journey is endless, but she started it and thank you so much. And I feel not that we meet much, but whenever I need you, you are there. And that is what a leadership is all about, being there. And Roberta, remember every time we talk, we talk about being there for each other. And um, this is the seven- You always are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nala. So the se this year is the 75th session of UN General Assembly. So we would like to hear briefly one goal or few goals which are really passionate and why is it passionate to you. But some of you have already touched it in your answers. But for our record, for the session, we would love to hear. Let's start off with Becky. Um, Nyla, I want to thank you also for your uh, consistent leadership. I feel like it's it's been an honor knowing you and working with you as well. Um, I, I really have to say reducing inequity is really uh, crucial, especially when we talk about education. So mm -hmm. that is is top of mind, has always been a core um, value and and an important goal for me. Thank you very much, Lisa. Well, I'm gonna copy Beckett because she, I look up to her uh, so much, but yes, the, the UN goal of uh, reducing inequity is so important. And I believe this is the value of education uh, and, and a good solid public education that it gives us the opportunity to, uh, you know, to be the great equalizer. I would not be here without the quality education that I received at the UC. Uh, so I'm very much appreciative and I realize that I have been extremely fortunate because I've had that opportunity. Thank you very much. Roberta? Oh, Nyla, I just want to thank you for this conversation and Janet and to all of you. I've learned so much from each of you. So I do hope the conversation continues offline or, or wherever. I would say I'm, I'm passionate about all of the global goals and I see them as all interconnected. And so for me, I would say number 17, partnerships for the goals, which gets back to my joy and collaboration. Like how do we make all of these, how do we achieve all of them? And that we could do working together and, and collaborate. Hannah, may I sort of like end with you? Thank you so much, Naila. Thank you for these amazing opportunities. It's really inspiring to be in the company of such wonderful and accomplished women leaders. Now, for me, Naila, my passion is human development. So my dream is that every child achieves her potential everywhere in the world. So for this, every single SDG is important. So they are all close to my work and, and my passion. But uh, if I had to choose one, uh, I would uh, also choose uh, quality education. Uh, you know, many children, even before the pandemic, 260 million of children were still excluded from primary education. And plus there is the gap between being in school and actually learning. And from the analysis we have done is that 
one half of children are unable to read and comprehend a simple articles, even at the end of uh, primary education. And now the situation with the pandemic has further deteriorated. So now we see that 1.6 billion of children have had their uh, education interrupted. And in our analysis, the cost in terms of their lifelong earnings is $10 trillion. So it's a huge cost. It's a huge cost for human beings, for these children, for the rest of their life, and of course for the economy and for the society globally. So, uh, so that's what I, and I feel that during the pandemic, perhaps education has not received sufficient attention. However, to conclude, I would say, you know, we must work together on all the SDGs and uh, we must uh, protect and invest uh, in people now during the pandemic and for the way forward. Thank you very much. And before ending, I must say that we, are, we have more sessions like this, but at the end, we realize after this pandemic, as we carry on our journey, the mental conditions of people would become another pandemic during isolation. It has been tough for me. After eight months, I moved to the East Coast and I saw my family. It was tough. But I realized, like, if I feel so bad, what is happening to the rest of the people who don't have access? So we have to be more empathetic more compassionate about each other. And I know you all have responsibility, but even more now so to be for each other. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much.